former nuncio, uh, the permanent observer of the Holy See, had been in Haiti during the earthquake and for many years. And so while he was here, we got a ready, a steady dose of what was happening in Haiti. And I pray for Haiti all the time. Exactly. And then especially for this time, you know. Yeah, we really need leadership down there. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, I saw some people are online. I don't want to keep you, Father. It was nice talking to you. Oh, likewise. I didn't realize that other people are there. I don't see anybody <laughs> else. <laughs> yes. Oh, I'm, I'm muted. Hi, Father. Hi, Esther. How are you? I'm right, good. Thanks Again. for all the hard work you're doing. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> And so where are you based now? Are you, are you guys, everyone's at home or are they like still in the mission or? No, I'm at home. I'm in Long Island. Right. I Father, likewise, how about you? I likewise am at Holy Family Rectory, close to the UN. Oh, right. Martha, you look like you're on a boat. <laughs> I'm, I'm at home. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's wait for we're a little bit early, wait for a few minutes. Um and Marta, I will share the uh Queen of Heaven prayer. Okay, I'm going to send out a reminder on the WhatsApp group. And, um, Okay, hi everyone. We're just gonna wait a few minutes um, before we get started. So just hang out. Father, this Easter must have been very strange for all the priests involved. Yeah. It is. For, for most, everything's been different. Um, but we, we get through it, and um, I had a few people with me at a few small masses, and um, so they just happened to be good singers and the whole rest of it, and so we were able to do some beautiful, um, yeah. some beautiful little things, but very spatially distant and the whole rest of it, and everybody's wearing masks, and, but, um, but it's a Holy Week, it's a Lent, it's an Easter, none of us, priests and faithful alike will ever forget. And everyone has to figure out how to live stream their masses now. Well, p good for parishes to be doing it. Um, yeah. You know, I've made the choice that I would prioritize having a few people there. Mm -hmm. And once you're doing that, um, you, you don't live stream because then it would seem as if you're being disobedient. Or you're really not. Okay. You're still being safe in the in the rest, and so there there are a lot of good live stream situations out there. Um, some beautiful recordings, as well as some great priests who are, are live streaming. Yeah. It's been it's been very strange with my family bringing all my kids and watching the mass every week. <laughs> Such an interesting experience. Yeah. I encourage everybody to do it the way that they typically go to mass, dress up, mm -hmm. um, turn off their devices, 
yeah. um, stand when we're supposed to stand, kneel when we're supposed to kneel, sit when we sit. So it, 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 it helps a lot um, mm -hmm. so that we're not spectators. Okay, I think we can wait for one more minute. I'm going to quickly forward the WhatsApp again. Um, Okay, I think we're going to get started. So welcome everybody to the second uh, virtual UN clinic, uh, UN, I'm sorry, I said UN clinic, sorry, it's just too many meetings, UN Catholic Club um, meeting. And yes, please mute your mics if you're not speaking. Uh, if not, I can try to mute people as well. Um, and to start off, uh, we, we plan to actually um, do a prayer and then um, have Father Roger Landry give us a talk. And then we'll end with the Divine Mercy Chaplet. Uh, which Tina will lead. So um, I shall start maybe with an opening prayer and then we'll move on to the Queen of Heaven prayer. Okay, so um, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Oh, actually, Father, why don't you give us an opening prayer and then uh, we'll move on to the Queen of Heaven prayer. Oh. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of our faith. We thank you for loving us so much that you sent your son into our world, taking on our nature and giving that nature out of love so that we might live forever with you. Please help us to open ourselves up to the full miracle you wish to give us through his resurrection so that we might live a newness of life together with him and come to the fullness of life where he has ascended, and where you, he, and the Holy Spirit await us. We ask this in your son's name, risen from the dead, who is Lord forever and ever. Amen. 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 Thank Father, you. and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Um, so I'm going to just share the Queen of Heaven prayer, and um, Martha will lead us in this prayer. So hang on a minute. Um, Okay, so Marta, over to you. Dad, what's the pin for the computer? Oh, Mickey. Wait a minute. I've oh. got to mute people. <laughs> mute. Okay. Okay. It's... Okay. Marta. Okay, let's start. Queen of heaven, rejoice. Hallelujah. For he who you did whom marry, did marry here, hallelujah. hallelujah. Has risen, as we said, hallelujah. Pray for Pray us, for to, us God. to God. Alleluia. Rejoice and be glad over your Mary. Alleluia. For the Lord, the Lord has, truly has truly risen. risen. Alleluia. Alleluia. Okay, all together, let us pray. O oh God, who gave joy to the world through the resurrection of thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, grant we beseech thee that through the intercession of the Virgin Mary, his mother, we may obtain the joys of everlasting life. Through the same Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Okay. Okay. So, uh, Father, I think I'm going to stop my share and then, um, yeah, over to you, Father Landry. And uh, just to introduce, so Father Roger Landry, he has um, he's working with the Holy See Permanent Observer Mission to the United Nations since 2015. He is uh, one of our celebrities that have <laughs> joined us, but um, he. Uh, has written for many Catholic publications. He's the author of a 2018 book, Plan of Life, which I've read, and it's really great. Um, and so thank you so much, Father Landry, for doing this. And most importantly, uh, Father Landry really helped uh, me and Marta when we first had this idea for this group. And um, he gave us a lot of advice. And um, it's just someone that uh, we, we talk to and we need some help about this group. So thank you so much, Father, for joining us today. It's great to be with you, Esther and Marta, and all the members of the UNSRC Catholic Club. I'm thrilled that it's now in existence, and 
that it's um, still meeting even despite the various vicissitudes thrown in our way with COVID-19 and et cetera. Can everybody see my presentation? Um, I think you'll have to share your screen again. Yeah, okay, because it was I guess I took over just now, so you, you can share again, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to um, try to figure out how to do that one more time. Here we go. Um, yeah, got it. Okay. So everybody can see it now? Yes, good. So yes. I put it so that you don't have to look at me the entire time. You can look <laughs> at some more beautiful images and some more beautiful words. So... We've just now lived through the long Lent of 2020. This Easter has been a long time coming. Few would have foreseen on Ash Wednesday that our fast would become an involuntary one from the Eucharist, that our almsgiving would feature social distancing from those in need. Pope Francis is always talking about cercania, drawing close to those who are in need, and we've had to, out of charity, um, separate. Our prayer would occur mostly in the domestic church of our homes or apartments and cyberspace. We would have all had an extended meditation on how we're dust and unto dust we shall return without knowing the day or the hour. And the thief has taken on the appearance of a little virus. We would be led into the desert, separated from so many distractions late night shows, sports, parties, face-to-face -face commitments, um, Easter lunches with our family and friends. And then we would be wondering, like Mary Magdalene, who would roll away the stones from our churches, from our tabernacles, from our confessionals? It's been very difficult. This caught most of us on a weir, and we've all been having to make difficult adjustments. But if Lent is meant to prepare us for Easter, not just what Easter symbolizes, but the literal death and life reality it brings about, then this Lent of 2020 might prove to be, for all its difficulties and sufferings and adjustments, one of the most spiritually fruitful of our life. This year in particular, we know how much we need Easter, and not the Easter of egg hunts and chocolate bunnies. We know we need the risen Christ, St. Paul tells us, which we hear during the Easter Vigil, this is the sixth chapter of St. Paul's letter to the Romans. We were indeed buried with Christ through baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live in newness of life. Consequently, like what is that newness of life? You must think of yourself as being dead to sin and living for God in Christ Jesus. This is ultimately the life to which the entire preparation of Lent is meant to bring us. We know that there was a dramatic change in the life of the first apostles of Mary Magdalene, the disciples on the road to Emmaus, on the day Jesus rose from the dead, turning their lives right side up. They were crestfallen. Not only had they watched their friend be publicly executed, but they thought he was the Messiah who was supposed to kick out the Romans, they actually believed that he was a son of God. And how could God breathe his last on Calvary? And so as they were going to the tomb on Easter Sunday morning, they were expecting to anoint Jesus' corpse. Even though Jesus had promised three times what would happen to him, that he would be betrayed, handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, be mocked, scourged, crucified, and on the third day rise, they didn't believe those words. And even on Easter Sunday Mass, when St. John and Peter ran to the tomb, St. John tells us the end of his account, when they looked on in, they still didn't understand the meaning of the scriptures, that he had to rise from the dead. But once they recognized that tomb was empty, once Jesus started to appear, their life, which had been flipped upside down during the Passion, was now flipped again right side up. Imagine what it would have been like for Mary Magdalene to hear Jesus cry out her name in the garden. What it would have been like for those disciples on the road to Emmaus to meet that anonymous wayfarer and then recognize that it was Jesus whom, they, whom their eyes couldn't see in his risen body. 
in the same way that they had noticed him before. Imagine what it was like when Jesus walked through those double and triple bolted doors in the upper room and said, peace be with you, and showed his wounds. It was a dramatic transformation. Our lives are likewise supposed to be transformed. Now, we know the end of the story, whereas they didn't. So the surprise factor's not going to be the same. But the transformation is supposed to be profound. The living memorial of Christ's resurrection is meant to change us, to bring us to newness of life. So we can ask, how should the reality of Easter change us in general, and particularly during this time of COVID-19? I'd like to consider 10 different ways we can think about this change. First, in terms of faith. When St. John outran Peter to the tomb, when he looked in, he saw and believed. Now all the words that Jesus had said were coming true, and he gave it his assent. Easter's supposed to strengthen our faith. Remember what Jesus said to St. Thomas when he reappeared in the upper room. Thomas didn't believe in him, said, unless I probe his the nail marks in his wounds and the, put my hand into his side, I won't believe. And Jesus came back and he called Thomas and he said, place your hands here. See that it is truly I. Thomas didn't need to probe Jesus with his fingers because he just fell down and said, my Lord, my God. And Jesus responded to him, you are blessed, Thomas, because you have seen. But blessed are those who have not seen but believe. The first and fundamental response to the event of the resurrection has got to be our faith. Faith has two aspects of it. Faith is a belief in something, what the scholastic theologians used to call in Latin the fides quae, which means the content of our faith. But we believe that content on the basis of a trust in someone, what they call the fides qua, the faith by which we believe. It's that act of trust. If I were to tell you I am now 50 years old, I know you wouldn't be able to believe it because I look so much more youthful. But nevertheless, if you trusted me, you'd trust that fact even though you weren't present. In the life of faith, we believe the content of the faith because we trust in God who sent his son, who took on our nature, who gave that nature out of love for us, who rose from the dead, who sent the Holy Spirit, who founded the church, and promised that the church would never err once before he came a second time in what we need to believe or do in order to please God and enter into his life. Everything we believe flows from that trust in God. And so when, because of trust in God, Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh or drink my blood, you have no life in you. We believe it. When Jesus sends out the apostles from the upper room saying, Receive the Holy Spirit. Those who sins you forgive are forgiven. Those who sins you retain are retained. We believe him. When Jesus says your brother will rise as he did to Martha and Mary at the death of Lazarus, they trusted in him and said, Lord, we know that you are the one coming into the world. And they believe that fact because of their trust in him. So the resurrection is supposed to help us both in terms of the fides quae, the content of our faith. I believe in the resurrection as well as our faith in Jesus, who promised he would rise. So again, it's not just a faith in an event, but more importantly, it's a trust in the one who predicted and fulfilled his promise to rise on the third day. And we can sort of break those two parts down. Faith in the event, we can have tremendous confidence there. First, nobody's ever discovered Jesus' body. That's a negative proof. But like, if we found Jesus' body somewhere, it would all be over. Also, his appearances to very credible people, and they weren't hallucinating. And then, as the proclamation of the church, you know, we live in a virtual reality today in which people's imaginations can go and can imagine life and other planets and so much more. 2,000 years ago, the people were incredibly down to earth. When these illiterate, for the most part, fishermen, tax collectors, and relative nobodies were going around trying to convince them that this carpenter from Nazareth 
who had been crucified publicly had actually been raised from the dead, those people 2,000 years ago would never have believed such a story unless they found these witnesses very credible. First by the miracles that they were doing, then by the types of lives they were leading. Even when they were being threatened with death, they didn't cop that they had made up the story. And so St. Thomas Aquinas, 1,200 years after the resurrection said, if the resurrection didn't happen, and these fishermen and tax collectors and zealots were able to convince the ancient world that it had when it hadn't, that would be even greater a miracle than the resurrection itself. So we have great reason to believe in that event. Likewise, the resurrection helps us to grow in our trust in Jesus. You know, Jesus, when he was being challenged by the scribes and the Pharisees throughout his public ministry, they were asking him for one sign after another, and he was working one miracle after another. But finally, he just said, no sign will be given to this faithless generation except the sign of Jonah. Just as Jonah spent three days in the belly of the whale, so will the Son of Man spend three days in the belly of the earth. The resurrection was the greatest of all the signs of Jesus. And those signs confirm the truth of everything that he said. And so the first response to Easter is faith. And this is a time in COVID-19, which we're going to need our faith to be stronger, not only because of the secular ways that the whole pandemic is being responded to in certain places and the closing of the opportunities for, come, for us to come to worship, but also because even at home, we're going to have to take greater responsibility of faith. Next is conversion. Remember, as we hear Monday of, Holy, of Easter week, that as soon as Peter burst from those upper room doors, he called the people to conversion when they asked, what are we to do? He said, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus founded, we know, the sacrament of penance on Easter Sunday evening. When he went through those doors, wished them peace twice, shalom, and then he made them peacemakers. Greater peacemakers than even we have working for the United Nations. The greatest peacemakers are those who can forgive sins in Jesus' name. He says, just as the Father sent me, so I send you. We know why the Father sent the Son. He saved him, sent him as the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. Just as the Father sent me, so I send you. He breathed on them the Holy Spirit, said, those who sins you forgive are forgiven. Those who sins are retained are retained. And the only way they'd know which sins to forgive and which sins to retain would be if people told them what their sins were. And so the essential structure of the sacrament of confession was founded that night. Jesus breathed on the, uh, the Holy Spirit and the apostles because only God can forgive sins and sent them out with the Holy Spirit's power precisely to do that. That's what a priest prays at the beginning of absolution. God, the Father of mercies the death and resurrection of his son has sent the Holy Spirit among us for the forgiveness of sins. We know from the parable of the prodigal son that every resurrection is meant, every re reconciliation is meant to be a resurrection. Jesus said that the essence of this whole transformation is my son was dead and has been brought to life again. That great gift of conversion is meant to lead us to the expression of God's mercy that raises us to his life. Sometimes we have a false notion of conversion. We can think conversion is just the fight against sin, that I've got to make a course correction in my life, that I've got to give up that bad habit, whether it's gossiping, whether it's um, envying, whether it's pride, whatever it is. No, it's so much greater than that. Back in 2000, the future Pope Benedict received the catechist from around the world to the Vatican, and he preached about conversion, and he said, Conversion is all about a new life. It means coming to the conclusion that we're not really who we're supposed to be yet. And then we turn to Jesus who says, follow me. He says, I've done this as an example so that you might do the same. Who says, love one another as I have loved you. Conversion is ultimately about the newness of life that God gives us. It's far more a yes to God than it is a no to sinful activity, though it likewise involves that but it's fundamentally this newness of life that God gives us, that he wants us to have it to the full and that we embrace that gift. It's ultimately a death to our old ways 
and a birth to this life in communion with Jesus. And at the very end of the Easter octave, we celebrate, as we will, the Sunday, Divine Mercy Sunday. The whole exclamation point of Easter is in God's mercy, which we open ourselves up to receive in heeding the call to conversion. Third consequence of Easter is what I call a sorsum corda effect. Those are the Latin words in the middle of the Eucharistic um, preface that say, lift up your hearts. And we say we have lifted them up to the Lord. Easter is supposed to have that source and court effect on us. We hear from St. Paul on Easter morning, if you were raised with Christ, seek what is, a, what is above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Think about what's above, not what's of earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Easter is about seeking the things of God. The resurrection lifts us from obsessing about worldly things helps us to view everything increasingly from God's perspective. Jesus tells us that where your treasure is, there will your heart be. We begin to put our treasure in God. And that doesn't mean we flee from this world. But we begin to find God in this world. We begin to look from the perspective of God at everything he puts on our plate here. Rather than taking us away from our neighbor, helps us to love our neighbor so much more because we recognize our neighbor is not just a mere mortal, but looked at with the eyes of God, somebody truly in his image and likeness. What does this mean at a practical level? If we're lifting up our hearts, it means we're prioritizing prayer, the most important activity we Catholics do. We prioritize worship of God, we prioritize getting to know his word through sacred scripture. You know, this would be a beautiful time for us to get to read the Bible. It takes only 12 to 15 minutes a day to read the entire Bible in a year. It takes only 70 to 75 hours. We might still have that time at home during this COVID. What a great way to be able to grow in faith so that our thoughts become more God's thoughts that we read and our words become more God's words that we enflesh. You know, St. Paul said, your life is hidden with Christ and God. Most of us during these days are hidden with God at home. What a great way truly to be with God as he comes to our homes. Third consequence, or fourth consequence is presence of God. Risen from the dead, Jesus is no longer bound by the limits of the humanity he assumed. He can be always with us, and he wants to be even if we're socially isolated, even if we might be solitarily hooked up to a ventilator, we're not alone. The same reason Jesus who walked through the closed doors of the upper room can traverse the doors of our apartment or the most highly guarded hospital quarantined. And he wants to be there. He wants to accompany us like he journeyed with the disciples on the road to Emmaus. He wants to join our conversation, make our hearts burn by relating present events to what God has revealed. Now, that's an incredible scene in Emmaus. Jesus doesn't show up to these two disciples who are heading downhill away from Jerusalem into darkness and say, where the heck do you think you guys are going? He just says, what are you talking about as you journey along the way? And they were shocked at what had happened. They had placed their hope in Jesus. And Jesus um, had seemed to crush their hopes. But when Jesus started to walk with them, he helped them to see that his, res his, his crucifixion was not a contradiction of the prophecies, but a confirmation of them, that he had to suffer and so rise from the dead. And that's when they got a holy heartburn. Jesus wants to accompany us and say, what are you talking about as you're journeying? Where is your heart at? So that he might be able to relate what we're presently going through and all it's difficulty to him that he will be with us always until the end of time he's very much alive and he's with us and as pope francis says living at your side every day to enlighten strengthen and free you and so we become more aware that our life is imbued with god's presence and once we're really aware that he's helping us in every aspect of our life our life changes and our hearts are more easily lifted up Fifth consequence is joy. St. Luke's account tells us, while the disciples were still incredulous for joy and were amazed, their first thing, once they realized Jesus wasn't a phantasm, 
but to be filled with happiness. Joy is meant to be our fundamental response to the reality of Jesus' resurrection. We pray with Psalm 118 throughout this Easter octave, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Be exalted that we sing at the Easter vigil. Let this holy building shake with joy. The strife is over. Let us swell the joyful strain. The Easter season is one long ode to joy with celestial choirs even greater than Beethoven. In the Eucharistic preface, we pray, overcome with paschal joy. Jesus wants to give us this gift, just like the first disciples received it. Léon Blois, that great 20th century French intellectual, was not a very joyful man in his life. He was very difficult to get along with, but he, was, he had incredible insights. And he said, joy is the most infallible sign of God's presence. Because when we really have God inside dwelling, life is changed. And even when we're suffering, our joy cannot be taken away from us. Jesus came so that his joy might be in us and our joy might be complete. And that can happen, and it's not a contradiction, even in times of difficulty, because the roots of joy are cruciform. Sixth is charity. We remember Christ's dialogue with Simon Peter after the resurrection, when he asked him three times, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And three times Simon Peter replied, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus' response to that was not to say, cool, Peter, awesome. You love me, I love you. No, I love you, you're, you love me. We're one happy family. That's not what he said. He said, not love me as I have loved you, but feed my sheep, feed my lambs, tend my sheep. Peter's love for Jesus, risen from the dead, would be concretized in his care for the good shepherd's sheep and lambs that he was entrusting to Peter. Again, Jesus said, love one another as I've loved you, not love me. Our love for Jesus would be shown precisely in our love for others, because we recognize how much Jesus love others, loves others and seeks to dwell within them. Love is sacrifice. No one has any greater love, Jesus told us during the Last Supper, than to lay down his life for his friends. Love really is translated into a willingness to suffer for others and even to die for them. When I prepare couples for marriage, I always turn, I give them 12 essays to write so that I can meet them where they're at and take them to where the church wants them on the day of their marriage. And one of the questions is, what does love mean? And what's distinctive about marital love? A lot of the times you'll get these sweet little responses of, you know, straight out of the top 40 on the billboard charts of what the singers are singing. But real love is willing the good of the other for the sake of the other. It's choosing it as a habitual thing of life. And so I eventually get the people around to seeing love involves the sacrifice. And I ask the would-be groom, would you take a bullet for her? And what's always been impressive to me is every single one of the 500 or so couples that have prepared for marriage, the guy has said, yes, I would. And then I start making it more concrete. What if the grenade you have to jump on is showing up on time? What if it means cleaning up after yourself? What if it means staying chaste until you're married? What if it means getting to know your faith better so that you can share it better with her, whatever it is? Love involves a sacrifice, it involves a willingness. The resurrection helps us to see that when we give our lives for others, we don't lose our lives. In fact, we save them, we gain them. When we go the way of the grain of wheat, Jesus tells in John 12, that's when we bear great fruit. And so charity is this great consequence of the resurrection. It spurs us to love others more with even greater sacrifice, because we know that when we love, we don't lose. Courage is the seventh. The first disciples were totally changed by the resurrection. Whereas they had left the upper room on Holy Thursday to betray and abandon Jesus, after the resurrection with the help of the Holy Spirit, they evacuated those same upper room, those same doors of the upper room, and then changed the history of the world. They would proclaim Jesus from this point forward. 
even when those who had gotten Jesus crucified, the Sanhedrin, had Peter and John scourged. Think about Mel Gibson's The Passion. That actually happened to Peter and John, too. Had them scourged and commanded them never again to speak of Jesus, threatening them with death, just like they had seen happen to Jesus. Their threats were real. But Peter and John continued, knowing that if Jesus were raised on the 40th hour, they too would be raised. That type of faith in the resurrection was what gives courage to the martyrs, that they know that as soon as they die here on earth, they pass into God's eternal presence. And so they're able to be audacious. Courage, as we know, is not the lack of fear, but of doing what we ought despite our real fears. And the risen Jesus tells us, be not afraid. And in the face of COVID-19, in the face of various other challenges, Jesus is with us. And his resurrection sh shows us that life turns out right when we live it through, with, and in Jesus. Eighth is a vibrant hope in eternal life. Each of us can say with Job, I know my Redeemer lives. Each of us can echo St. Paul. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? God gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And when we really celebrate the resurrection, we're celebrating that triumph, not as an, a, a fact of something that doesn't immediately implicate us, but as something in which we're very much involved. At a time when so many have been stunned by the sudden death of those we know and love, we know that an imperishable crown awaits those who live believe and die in Jesus. And so that's why we Christians don't grieve like all the rest who have no hope. We have hope as we grieve. We still mourn because we love and we miss, but we mourn with hope. Hope that God not only so loved the world that he gave his only son that we might not perish, but raised his son as the first fruits for those who have died, not the last. The resurrection gives us that indomitable hope. And we particularly as Christians during this time need to show that hope to a world that is being eaten alive by the cancer of fear. Ninth is shearing the faith. Jesus risen from the dead gives us the commission to shear that news and its significance. To Mary Magdalene, he said, go tell my brothers, I'm going to my father and your father, to my God and your God. We've dubbed her over the course of the centuries, Apostola Apostolis, the apostle to the apostles. She shared that great news. We have seen the Lord. To the apostles, he said, you are the witnesses of these things. And then right before he ascended to heaven, all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to carry out all that I've observed you, uh, commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always until the end of the world. Jesus gives us to that mission. Pope Francis tells us, what kind of love would not feel the need to speak of the beloved, to point him out, to make him known? One of the beautiful passages in his uh, exhortation, The Joy of the Gospel, is we as Christians know that life's different with Jesus. It's not the same to walk without him as to walk with him, to hear his voice in prayer is not to pray, to adore him is not to place ourselves in his presence. Because we've experienced life is richer with Jesus, that's why we evangelize, because out of love for our neighbor, we want them to have that same gift. So we share the faith. And the last of the 10 differences I'll mention is life according to the Holy Spirit. We begin to live by the principle, by the person, Jesus himself is sent. Remember what the Lord told us during the Last Supper. He said, I'll ask the Father and he'll give you another advocate. Jesus was the first advocate. He was the first defense attorney, to use the legal language of the time of the Bible, to be with you always, the Spirit of truth. Said, likewise, the Holy Spirit that the Father will send in my name will teach you everything and remind you of all that I've told you. We'll develop this in a second. When the advocate comes, whom I'll send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify to me, and you also 
testify. That's a command. It's an imperative. Because you've been with me from the beginning. And then very powerfully, he says, amen, amen, I say to you, it is better for you that I go. For if I do not go, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. In other words, if you had to have a choice between the Holy Spirit and me, Jesus saying, choose the Holy Spirit. It's better for you that I go. Now, thanks be to God, we don't have to choose between the second and third person of the Blessed Trinity. We can have them both together with the Father. But that's how important the Holy Spirit is in the Christian life. And a lot of the times, the Holy Spirit remains the great unknown in our life. To tr truly be touched by the experience of Easter is to prepare for the exclamation of Easter, which is Pentecost, in that new life given to us, not by our own principle, but by the Holy Spirit, God dwelling within us. Before the ascension, Jesus promised to send us his gift. I'm sending the promise of, of my Father upon you. Stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. He told them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, in the ends of the earth. Pope Francis said that the resurrection is not just an event of the past, it is a vital power that we need. And that power is the dunamis, that Greek word for the Holy Spirit. He is that power poured out upon us. We know what happened on Pentecost. Like a strong driving wind, think a hurricane, blew open the windows of the upper room and came down as tongues of fire. When I prepare kids for confirmation, I always ask, God could have taken on any form at all. Why didn't he come down as a lukewarm armpit? Why didn't he come down as a cold, big toe? He came down as tongues of fire for a reason. Tongue symbolizes speech. Fire symbolizes passion or ardor. The Holy Spirit comes down upon the church as tongues of fire so that we might be able to live and share our faith with great passion. To summarize, the Holy Spirit helps us grow in faith, which was the first consequence of the resurrection. Piety is a gift of the Holy Spirit, reverence. It helps us to convert and live newness of life in that great Pentecost sequence, the Veni Sancti Spiritus. We say, cleanse that which is unclean, water what is dry, heal what is wounded, bend what is inflexible, fire what is chilled, correct what goes astray. The Holy Spirit's mission is precisely to lead us to a full conversion, his death and resurrection in Christ. He helps us to seek the things that are above. That's Romans 8, 5. If we're living according to the Spirit, we seek the things of the Spirit. Recognize that we are God's dwelling place, that the presence of God is not just somewhere out there. The presence of God, God seeks to dwell within us. 1 Corinthians 16 is you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit helps us burst with joy, which is the second fruit of the Holy Spirit, in that list of them in Galatians 5.22. Love, charity, is the first fruit that we see. Holy Spirit helps us to truly love God and love others. Holy Spirit helps us to grow in courage. It's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, as we see in Isaiah 11. Holy Spirit helps us to have a vibrant hope in eternal life. St. Paul tells us in the letter of the Romans, if the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies too. So the Holy Spirit helps us in this world to experience not just physical life, what the Greeks called bios, where we get the word biology, zoological life, but zoe, which is this higher form of life. When Jesus says, I have come so that you might have life and have it to the full, it's this real life of the soul, this life in communion with God. He'll give us that life, the Holy Spirit, even in this world. And when we have that life dwelling within, death is nothing other than a change of address. And lastly, the Holy Spirit helps us to share faith. In Acts 5, the apostles say, we are witnesses of these things, as is the Holy Spirit that God has given us. Our testimony is always a joint testimony together with the Holy Spirit. So that's why we're bold. Even if others might be smarter than us, even if others may have all the arguments, etc. The Holy Spirit plus us gives us really good odds. If you'd want to 
copy of this presentation if I've gone too fast in my New England accent. Um, you can go to catholicpreaching.com and just go to the right column over on the right side and the presentation will be there. I'm happy if we have time to enter into a discussion and take whatever questions you'd have about applying some of these things to your life. Great, thank you so much, Father. Um, yeah, I think it was a great reminder of um, how we should live Easter even at this time. Uh, that all these still ring true, even though we don't, we may not feel like it. We're all 